I'm Brianna Thrussell, two-time Olympian and current world record holder in the 4x200 freestyle relay. Welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. Welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Kennedy, and I'm here to help you become the very best version of yourself. Brianna, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Absolute pleasure. After a few little technical difficulties here, we're, we're about to dive in. How has your day been so far? Obviously, bef- before we hit record, um, you were mentioning how heavy the training load is at the moment. I'm sure the listeners would be absolutely gobsmacked to hear about it. So what's your morning look like so far? Uh, so yeah, it's been a busy morning so far. The alarm went off at 5am and then I was up and to the pool and I started my day with we just do about 15, 20 minutes of yoga before we get in the pool just to, we came off a really, really hard um, day of training yesterday. So we uh, we do yoga to sort of lengthen ourselves and just relax before getting in the pool. And then we swam six kilometers and then I was in the gym for an hour and now I'm here on the recording. Beautiful. So you were mentioning before how you're in pre-season at the moment, obviously in the lead up to Paris in 2024 which is super exciting and we'll dive into to more about that throughout the, the chat today. But when you say pre-season, can you give us an idea of what that training load looks like at the moment um, and I guess how that differs from, from when you're in different training blocks um, in the lead up to a competition, whether it's the games or obviously you've got the World Championships coming up as well, which will probably be a, a little bit different in terms of prep this time around considering it's before the games. But yeah, are you able to give us an idea of what, uh, a typical pre-season day or, or week looks like for you? Yeah, absolutely. I think pre-season's sort of our, our really heavy load of the season. It's where we get a lot of, as our coach likes to call it, meat and potatoes work done. The volumes are really high in the pool and it's also the volume outside of the pool that's a lot higher. So at the moment we have almost five circuits a week, two runs, two bike sessions, about three or four core sessions, a Pilates to yoga so yeah there's a lot of work that goes in uh in three gym sessions as well there's a lot of work that goes in outside of the pool itself um and then in the water we're training nine sessions a week and our volume um in the water is a bit higher as well so i'm sitting up at about six kilometers each session um so yeah the week's really solid um yeah i probably spent over i reckon i've spent about six kilometers total my whole life (laughs) um yeah, so I think, yeah, yesterday we almost spent eight hours at training. So, yeah, they're big days, that's for sure. Um, and then sort of when we get really into like the nitty-gritty part of the season, it become our training's a lot more performance-based. So um, the session sort of, let's say, Wednesday, Friday morning where we have single days, so like only the morning, those sessions are a lot more sort of aerobic and recovery-based and we're expected to perform on our like main session days. So that becomes really important to be hitting goal times, to be being able to push, um, you know, and be really speedy in training and that sort of thing. And outside of the pool, we do still have our three three gym sessions and Pilates, but um, our sort of circuits and our land-based exercise is heavily, heavily reduced just to sort of, um, I guess, lighten the load. And so we're coming into like those main sets a lot fresher and being able to hit those goal times. Yeah, for sure. And I guess with the land-based stuff, obviously um, being a, a swimmer, your actual performance is in the pool. How how much do you find the the land-based training um, aids in improving in the pool? And is it is it purely just to be getting some form of conditioning outside of just swimming all the time or what benefits do you see from let's say doing running sessions or um, I guess where's the most benefit for you when you when we talk about things like being in the gym and and lifting weights and stuff what type of um, movements or training do you really feel has that crossover to when you, you get in the pool? Yeah, I think land-based work is so, so important for swimming. Um, You know, you can only do a certain amount of kilometres on the shoulders in a week sort of thing. So we do need that additional sort of aerobic Mm -hmm. training, which is why we're running and we're on the bike. Um, I'm probably the world's worst runner. I did a 5K on Tuesday night and my heart rate got to 203. So (laughs) it's something that really doesn't come naturally to me. I hate to use the obvious shit joke here, but... Um, I'm going to say fish out of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, 
and that's the other thing is um <laughs> I'm just not good on land like you know I, I'm I like I guess my plyometrics is okay because I am a bit more on the sprinty side in the pool but I'm I can't run like probably the gym is something I have always tried to like work really hard in because you know muscle gain doesn't come that naturally to me um so yeah the land-based activities mm -hmm. I find really challenging but I know that they're so beneficial to swimming um in particular like the core sessions like um I, people probably don't quite understand that swimming is so core focused like you need such a strong and stable core to be able to swim um uh, especially with butterfly when it's um like the kick is like quite like a rhythmic kick, which stems from your core. So yeah, like that is of such high importance. And then, you know, the bike and the running is just aerobic conditioning. Uh, I personally find that running really helps my kick. Um, you know, it strengthens my hip flexors, that sort of yep. thing. So I, I see great benefits there. And then gym is, um, we always will have gym three times a week, all year round, no matter what sort of stage of the season. Although the gym will look very different. Um, like at the moment we're just, and wraps everything's as many reps as possible and it's um it's tough but i think because we're doing so much cardio we want to keep muscle on um so everything's and wraps mm -hmm. but that's all right and i yeah for me gym doesn't come naturally but it's something i'm really working on and have been for the past few years because being like a bit more of a shorter to middle distance um we need a lot of strength so um yeah gym is of high importance What's the nutrition side look for you in terms of calorie intake? Is that something that you're tracking? Obviously, the amount of energy output that you would be doing is extreme. And we often hear about, you know, the the calorie intake of, of certain swimmers when they're in their kind of peak training periods and whatnot. Um, can you give us an idea of, of how many calories you're having to consume, I guess, to even maintain weight, let alone trying to retain muscle mass as well? Uh, yeah. So I was actually, I wear both like a whoop and a Apple watch. So I was sort of, I like, I really enjoy data and I was having a look last night and we were, oh, I personally burnt over 4,000 calories in training yesterday. So it's a lot. And the other thing that's wow. quite difficult is when we're training for eight hours, fueling's quite hard. Like I didn't get home and from morning training until 11 AM. So, and that whole morning I was I had like a protein or like a, yeah, like a Carmen's protein bar before I went to training and I didn't eat until 11 and I had like a big bowl of oats and that sort of thing. And like a uh, high protein yogurt because I protein is very important. Um, yeah. And then like we sleep for an hour and then we typically have a really small lunch because we're going to be back in the pool and like all back doing a circuit in an hour's time. So uh, fueling around training can be quite difficult when we're in like a period of such long training sessions. So that's when the importance of like intra training fueling comes in. So I um, have only just mm. actually started taking gels during training because I ended up being on, um, look, when I got in the off season, which was only two weeks, I got into running a little bit and I ended up on running TikTok. And I just noticed that these girls were going for a 15 K run. Well, it's like an hour and a half or whatever it may be. And they were taking two gels with them. I'm like, I'll swim for two hours or a gym for an hour and I'll do another circuit and I will not have anything except water and electrolytes. I was like, oh, I probably need to improve my intra-training fueling. So yeah, at the moment I'm, um, yeah, having like Coda gels, which has like 30 grams of carbs in it to like try to replenish um, those stores and also like a sports drink, which has mm -hmm. both electrolytes and carbohydrates in it to keep on replenishing during training. But yeah, it's hard when, you know, you say you're you're doing really hard training, you don't really feel like stomaching kind of like a gel sort of thing. But like I know for me, I just have to sure. force it down because like that's the only way you can get through training. And I've noticed a huge difference personally in um, by adding in those little things like the gels and just getting that carbohydrates in. So, um, yeah, like that's, yeah, something I'm really working on this season and have only kind of just started in the past few weeks when I realized that, um, you know, I need to probably focus on getting some more fuel in. Otherwise I'm not going to make it to the end of the session. And yeah. And then obviously we have a really, really big dinner. Um, I mean, not that big because coming off a run with my heart rate's 203, I can't really say I feel like much before going to bed, but um, <laughs> I know that it's of high importance. So yeah, it, all my meals are very protein focused to try and keep the muscle on. 
uh, or even gain muscle during this sort mm. of preseason. Um, but sort of my, I guess my theory and philosophy around nutrition is everything in moderation. Like I will admit I have the mm-hmm. biggest sweet tooth in the world. I love my sweets. I love my chocolate and I, it's something I'll never cut out. Sorry. But um, yeah. And I just believe in everything in moderation. Brilliant. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's super interesting to to hear about the nutrition side. I think, um, I, I think for a lot of the audience, obviously majority of the time they're focus on nutrition obviously i dare say not one of the the audience is an olympic swimmer so a lot of the time their focus on nutrition is purely around the body composition and and i even mentioned to a lot of my clients the importance of even if your goal is body composition if you can start to look at nutrition more so for fuel and and understanding the role that plays with your training and even just your energy levels and mood and whatnot throughout the day um, it can make a significant difference what does the nutrition look like for you on competi- uh, competition day? Obviously, would, I'm assuming it would differ depending on what time your event is, but um, is there? do you have like a ritual or a bit of a, a superstition around certain meals before you race or how far out from getting in the pool do you have your last meal and, and what does that look like? Um, I'm a bit of a creature of habit, to be honest, and I guess with swimming we're, we're quite lucky that you know, typically it's always heats in the morning, always finals at night. So we know exactly how our day is going to go. Yes, the time of heats and the time of finals will vary like within reason, but, you know, that's always how the day is going to look. So um, I guess for, you know, 10 years, 12 years being on the senior team, I know that I'm going to get up and have my oats and my yogurt and my high protein granola, my peanut butter for my breakfast. And that will probably be about two, two and a half hours out from say heats. And then mm-hmm. I probably won't really have much more food until post-race. Um, like I'll sip on some electrolytes. Um, maybe I'll have like I am big on these like little packets of sour raisins and I just know that that's really, really quick fuel. Like um, obviously they're quite high GI, so like um, quickly absorbed. Um, so, yeah, maybe a little packet of raisins. And then, um, yeah, we race and then I try to get fuel in immediately. Some sort of... Um, like carb protein sort of thing start like recovering um something pretty small because i know that when i go say back to the hotel um for lunch i'll have like a good lunch then um yeah and then it'll be like another little snack and probably a coffee two hours out from finals and then yeah post um post race again we just try to get a little bit of fuel in and then yeah a big dinner but i guess with swimming my races last a minute to two minutes so we're not you know I guess expending (laughs) a lot of energy as such you know we're not going out and like running 10 kilometers or like our races are very short so fueling is is important but I would say nutrition and fueling around training is so much more important than sort of when it comes to race day because like it's just kind of like a normal day of what we what we have practiced with training yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, the volume is is significantly different. One last question, because I want to kind of take things back a little in a second, and we'll touch on the the competition side again soon. But the last question around this is: in training, how often are you trying to swim your competition time or close to your competition time? Like, is that something that is a regular occurrence weekly, or is it is it purely based off how you're tapering your training and, and periodizing to only be making an effort for that that type of speed uh semi-regularly or I, i'm just curious as to how that looks yeah um my short answer is almost never um in like a really highly highly specific period like i'm gonna say two to three weeks out from olympics or olympic trials we might do mm-hmm. let's say 100 butterfly best effort so that would probably be the only time that i yep replicate race distance and try to replicate race pace for the whole distance whereas um i guess our training more looks like okay we're going to go 650s and you need to hold x amount of time or we're going to go 825s dive best effort like as fast as you can go um which hopefully is race speed or faster but it's only for 25 Mm -hmm. minutes so yeah i guess our training looks yeah, okay. different to to how we actually race just to build that yeah i guess build fatigue understand what race pace feels like without actually like a race so like let's say a 200 freestyle for example we might just go 450s 
at at race pace as such. So kind of what you want to hold for the 200, but you don't actually do the 200. You have a break after each 50. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I was just curious because I've never really um, spoken too much uh, to any real competitive swimmers around that because, I, I mean, yeah, it's obviously it's very – I'm assuming it's probably different from um, depending on which event. Like would someone doing, say, a much longer distance, would they be would they be kind of replicating their – um, race pace more often when they're in training because I'm assuming like the the actual training sessions and the structure and the style and whatnot would would differ quite drastically between say a longer distance swim in comparison to more of a sprint. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I guess someone say I guess our longest distance is the fifteen hundred, um, and yeah, they I, I guess like they travel at a slower speed than what you'd swim for a hundred meters, obviously. So. I guess they can probably hit that 1500 pace a lot more easier in training than what you can a hundred meter pace. So um, they probably do, I wouldn't say replicate their race as such, but they can probably swim a lot more at the pace they need to hit because it is that bit of a slower pace because it's such a, like a lot further distance. Yeah. I mean, this is just i I'm curious about this. So knowing that your distance is obviously much shorter than that and hearing the amount of volume that you're doing in the pool and, and also obviously it's preseason, but the amount of work you're doing outside of the pool as well. How does that correlate to someone who's then doing say the 1500 meters? Like are they doing a similar amount of volume just at different paces than what you're doing? Or, or what does that look like in comparison from a, let's say a sprinter to someone who's doing more of an endurance based event? Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like the squad I'm in, uh, like my training group as such, no one really goes above sort of the 800, uh, the 800 meter freestyle. So everyone follows a very okay. similar structure. So on land at the moment, we're all the same. We all do the same land work. Uh, I mean, gym's quite specific to, you know, our like tailored to our needs and our strengths and what we're working on. But in terms of the circuits yeah. and the running and the bike, everyone's the same. Um, it's just the volume in the pool is different. So like the sprinters might be sitting at about 5K, middle distance at six, and then distance at seven or eight kilometers. So they do travel like over a week, they're probably traveling 10 to 12 kilometers further than me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, I guess coming all the way back to, to when you were growing up. So you grew up in WA. When did you, I guess, first know that competitive swimming was something that you wanted to pursue um, I guess, moving into adulthood and, and, and making it something that you make a career out of? Like how early were you doing competitive swimming and was it something that I guess um, ran in the family or is it, was there friends that were interested in it? Like what really, I guess, was the catalyst for you to, to go all in with this? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I've swum my whole life and I think for me, I just loved it when I was young. Yeah, I was probably... I yeah I guess I started off with like learn to swim as a really young girl and then um, I guess my parents sort of thought you know water safety is really important being Australia we have a very like water-based culture with the beaches and pools and that sort of thing so um, I learned to swim at a, like a very young age and I loved it and then I wanted to just like do squad swimming like two or three times a week when I was I don't know, seven or eight um, and it was just a really really natural progression like it was just like typically a love for the sport that made me um made me want to do it I guess um and then like as I became a little mm. bit older I realized like okay like I'm okay at this I was at school and I was winning um you know winning school races that sort of thing and uh, I started just to take it a little bit more seriously and then I went to my first um age nationals at the age of 12 and um yeah, like I didn't perform that well. It was like, I guess my first nationals. But then the following year when I was 13, I came home with a few medals and I sort of made my first, you know, junior Australian team. And I was like, oh, wow, this is exciting. And then each year from there, I just I um, took it like that little bit more seriously. But for me, I think the penny really dropped in um, 2012. I was 16 and I went to my first um, like senior national, so like open, so for anyone. And yep. um, I made the 100 butterfly final and I was, yeah, I was 16 and I qualified last in lane eight. And I mean, like there was like Jess Schiffer, Stephanie Rice, like um, an incredible caliber in that race. And I was like, wow, like 
two of these girls from this race are going to be picked on the Olympic team this year. And I think for me, I was like, you know what? I want to be on the team in four years time. So um, from 2012 to 2016 was when I was really like, okay, I know what I want to do. I want to qualify for Rio in 2016. Um, Yeah. So that was really when the penny dropped for me that I wanted to pursue this as a full-time career, I guess. And yeah, 2016, I made the team. And then yeah, again in 2021, and I'd love to go for my third next year. Incredible. That's amazing. So you've obviously then made the the move you were saying before we hit record. You've you've made the move a couple of years ago from WA up to Queensland. Now something that I I think it's evident in in anyone who's successful in regardless of whether it's it's an athlete or someone in business or, or any areas of life is the is the ability to be able to adapt to new environments or new circumstances or um, new variables, whether it be within training and in competition or whether it's just in life in general. So how has that, I guess, change been for you? Obviously, moving away from family, being in a completely different environment. um, How did you find that whole process of, I guess, just shifting your whole life from one side of the country to the other? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, uh, when I first moved, I, to, to be honest, I hadn't planned on leaving WA. It was just a bit of a, uh, a situation occurred where the coach that I was swimming under got the job on the Sunshine Coast. And I don't okay. know if you know swimming in WA, but it's not very strong. So there was about 12 of us swimming under this one guy and he was the only really, really good coach in WA. So um, the 12 of us really had no option. So... I think it took swimming, like it almost took six months to get a new coach in after like my coach left. So we all sort of, all 12 of us packed up and followed him to the Sunshine Coast. Uh, And it was a great Mm -hmm. decision. I'm so happy I went and so happy. Yeah, I followed him. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess moving, it was the first time I lived out of home, which was a huge, um, I guess, shock. Huge but step. knowing knowing that like the 12 of us moved together to a new city where I don't think a single person had been before. Like I'd never been to the Sunshine Coast. So we we had each other. And unfortunately that time um, WA was locked up like Fort Knox. So there was no one going in or going out. So I couldn't get home for Christmas um, mm-hmm. that year. But um, the 12 of us had each other. So it was actually like, yeah, a really pleasant experience. Um, yeah. And then for me, I did decide that, um, I'm probably towards the end of my career and I just wanted a change. Like I had been under that coach for, for six or seven years and I was like, Oh, I just want to, I just want to change and give it one last crack for my last few years. So I then, um, yeah. I moved to, to Dean, um, in Brisbane who coaches Ariane Chitmas, the, the, um, the girl yeah. who won two and four at the Olympics. So, um, and that was a big change, but it's incredible. Like, I probably never thought I could push my by my body and my mind as far as I have. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited for the season ahead. But um, yeah, like you said, like the people you surround yourself with is is kind of a reflection of you. And uh, we had ten of us make the senior team this year, and I think I think ten out of the ten brought home medals from world championships. So I think that just goes to That's show. Brilliant. Oh, like. I don't think it's ever, it was the record, we set the record this year for the most amount of people from one club on a senior team, um, which was amazing. And then I think I think every single one of us brought home medals. So um, just to be surrounded by the most incredible athletes, the most incredible coach and support staff every single day, day in, day out is, um, yeah, is just something that like words can't describe. That's amazing. It sounds like you're in a really good space obviously physically but mentally as well how important is that how important is it to have that relationship or the connection with a coach in something like swimming obviously spending so much time around them and and whatnot obviously from a professional standpoint they they need to be in a position that's going to allow you to grow and and improve but is that something that you I guess consider I'm sure it was a big consideration when you change coaches but um, how important is that relationship with the coach uh, I think it's very important for me. Um, I would say that communication is key to a lot of things in life. And I think having that yep. um, that really good working relationship with your coach where I know I have ultimate faith and trust in him and he has the same in me um, 
is just like that's something that is required and I think being able to just openly communicate um with him is yeah something that's yeah really important like I think for me on Wednesday night he texts me before my final exam saying or my final uni exam ever saying um you know good luck and then I told him I finished 8 p.m and at 801 he called me how was it congratulations and I just think like a coach that's so invested and cares about you is so so important and you know he cares about us outside of the pool as well you know to call me and say congratulations for finishing your degree that is um yeah that that's just something that's so meaningful and so thoughtful so I just think having that you know open communication is so important yeah it's incredible sounds like he really cares about you as a person um not just as an athlete which obviously goes a long way and I think it allows you to to completely buy in as well, both obviously mentally and physically, but but having the the actual will to to push yourself in competition and and outside of it to continue to be able to I guess reward reward his efforts by continuing to improve as well. I'm curious to 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 ask you what the feeling was like inside winning an Olympic gold. I guess I could describe it as bittersweet because I didn't actually stand on the podium. I was the heat swimmer for the relay that won gold. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, it's hard to uh, even call myself Olympic gold medalist. And like with that came like OAM. So I'm technically my title is Brianna Frostle OAM, but it's something that I probably don't throw around everywhere because, um, yeah, I guess I didn't stand on that podium and receive the gold with the girls. I myself and I think one or two others did just swim the heat. So, and I mean, heat swimmers always get the medal. It's like, um, that's all, uh, yeah, that mm-hmm. always happens. But um, yeah, it's hard to sort of be like, yeah, I'm an Olympic gold medalist. And it's like, but I only swim the heat of that relay. So um, yeah, it's probably something that like, I wouldn't really call myself on a day-to-day basis. I would say like, I'm a two-time Olympian rather than an Olympic gold medalist, just because uh, the girls in that final of that I think yeah it was the four by one medley relay like they are Olympic gold medalists whereas I just mm-hmm. won the heat so um yeah it's it's a it's a tough one to sort of to say but I mean at the end of the day I did bring home a gold medal and obviously it's such an honor to win a gold for Australia especially when um you know swimming so like everyone loves the swimming at the Olympics so I think to to come home with a gold is something really special and yeah to do it in bring a gold is amazing does that play into, I guess, what your your main driving factor is throughout training and leading into competition? Like what is the, what's the ultimate for you? What's the thing that really drives you, particularly when, you know, you, you can't be fucked with training anymore or, or it's been a, a long day or it's getting difficult in the pool? What What is that one thing that really drives you that that you have that actual emotional attachment to that is is what you're striving for? Um, it's probably the qualification of the Olympics, which is – the driving factor I think for me like sort of my 100 butterfly mm-hmm. is probably um my highest importance of getting on the team but I also know that there's two or three girls just snapping it like Emma and I have sort of been number her number one maybe number two in the 100 butterfly but there's a whole lot of girls snapping at our heels so I know that um you know come Olympic trials I need to be have my best foot forward so um for me that's sort of my motivation every day knowing that um, these girls are improving. I also need to improve. So, um, yeah, just knowing that, yeah. I, and I mean, it's in June, it's not that long away. So it's not like it's, you know, we're three yeah. years out from the Olympics, the Olympics is next year. So for me, that is, that's my motivation. That's a driving factor. That's awesome. I think obviously as an athlete, um, you know, the, the lucky ones get to experience really high levels of success, but with success along the way also comes a lot of I don't know if failure is the right word, but setbacks as well. How do you how do you deal with those setbacks mentally in terms of do you have a process that you work through? Are you someone who deals with it quite well? Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear what that's like for you throughout your career when there has been setbacks. Um, how do you deal with it? Um, to be honest, touch wood, my career has been fairly smooth sailing. Um I haven't really come across any major injuries that have been setbacks or like I've sort of been on the team every year. It's like I've missed the team or, you know, missed, yeah, missed out on a medal sort of thing. So I think 
for me, I've been really lucky. Um, Mm -hmm. That being said, there's always disappointment. Like disappointment comes with everything. Everyone wants to be a perfectionist. So I, I guess my performance in Tokyo, I was a little bit disappointed with like at the Olympics. I mean, yes, I came home in the gold, but um, for me personally, I, I believe that could have achieved more. Um, and I'm not really someone who dwells on it too much. I'm like, okay, look, that wasn't ideal. Um, I guess the question is like, what went wrong? How do I improve that? And what am I going to do sort of to change it? So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, for me, it actually meant stepping away from the 200 butterfly. <laughs> Bloody hate the race. Don't ever want to do it again. So, um, too far. Don't like training for it. Don't like racing it. So a bit of a mental block. So I sort of sort of said to myself, I'm an older athlete now. The training for the 200 fly, I don't think my body's going to hold up. So I put that in a little box and yeah. I said, right, I'm putting my focus on the 100 fly and the 200 freestyle for the relay. So, um, yeah, I guess I yeah made changes and I was like, okay, well, with the 100 butterfly, it means I need to be stronger. I need to be uh, more explosive that sort of thing. So I guess I just made these small changes um, because I knew that the 200 butterfly just wasn't going to work for me anymore. Yeah. Looked at it practically. I like that. Was there someone growing up um, that you, I guess, idolized as a, as a swimmer or it may may have been an athlete or could be someone completely outside of the sport that, that you looked to for inspiration or motivation or or that you took, um, I guess, yeah, inspiration from, um, when, when we think about, you know, achieving levels of success or just, uh, being a, a good person in general? Um, for me, I've always sort of, I'm quite a, uh, like, I guess an independent person where I've been like, I always want to just, I want to write sort of my own story and I don't really want to follow in anyone's footsteps. I think that's kind of always been my theory in that being said, I, um, do like idolize Stephanie Rice. Her performance in 2008 at the Beijing Olympics was the most outstanding thing ever. And um, with a few sort of interactions that I've had with her, she has been um, so down to earth, so realistic. And um, she's someone that I just, yeah, really have a really good sort of, uh, I understand where she's coming from. So I think, yeah, I idolized her when I was younger. And then now that I've gotten to know her just a little bit, I'm like, yeah, I, yeah really like her as a person something that i always like asking guests on the show is is typically separate to their sport or their business or or whatever they're um i guess successful in but but it can also have some form of attachment to it do you what's something at the moment that i guess you feel like you're working on as a person like whether it be a vulnerability or whether it be something that you see as um again i don't know if weakness is the right word but something that you have the self-awareness around that you are really trying to improve on as a person or that you feel i guess vulnerable about that you've identified oh tough question um i think for me it would be overthinking um probably stems from things in my early sort of swimming career with it, like a really old coach that I had who probably typically liked to play mind games. And I think from that, I've only sort of realized in like the past, let's say two years that a lot of overthinking um, has stemmed from that. And it's, I guess it's overthinking in the way if someone says, Hey Bray, like, um, do you mind just giving me a call or do you mind like, let's say it's in school and they're like, um, do you think you could just meet with me tomorrow? I would panic. Like I'd be like, Oh my God, what have I done wrong? Yeah. Like, I'm a good kid. I don't misbehave. Like I was never like one of the naughty kids. <laughs> so for me, like overthinking has been something I'm have really tried to work on and am still working on. Um, and I mean, that's in all facets of life. Um, yeah, whether it yep. is, yeah, how someone, you know, if someone speaks to me in a bit of a different tone, I'm like, oh, what have I done wrong? They're angry at me. Where it's like, they could just be tired and having a mm-hmm. bad day. Like, so I think for me, um, really working on um, not overthinking as much, which I know I have improved on so like dramatically, but it's still something that, yeah, I yep. take into consideration a lot and still try to improve. Yeah, I think what I've found with overthinking in particular and whether it's with myself or whether it's with 
clients I work with on mindset or even within the fitness space, I think it typically comes, well, this is what I've found anyway, comes from almost like a, either an insecurity or a projection of like what we're kind of a, an assumption that we're making from like within inside. Then we put that assumption onto the the situation that we're, that we're in, as you said before, whether it's someone saying, can you give me a call about so-and-so or can we meet tomorrow? I need to talk to you. And, and instantly we make these, these assumptions and we turn this very small thing into some big event mentally, or we create all this stress and anxiety around something that was just never there. Yeah. So we kind of, we create these, uh, almost these issues for ourselves. Sometimes I, I had earlier this year, I was super, super fortunate to chat with Peter Crone on the podcast. I don't know if you've ever seen or heard any of his content before. Um, no. I'll send you a link to some of his stuff after this. Cause I've, he works with a bunch of athletes, um, around like psychological time and, understanding that when we're psychologically in the present then there's there's really no anxiety there's no depression there's no stress because we're we're right here and now and and if i think about myself right here now talking to you there's immediately absolutely nothing that i should be stressed or worried about because i'm sitting here just having a nice conversation with you whereas when we feel this stress or anxiety it's typically when we're psychologically living like in this future event that we're creating in our own head or when we feel this feeling of sadness or depression it's usually psychologically living back in the in the past and once you start to really understand that psychological time and how much that plays into like what we feel it, it makes such a big difference yeah 100 percent agree um yeah and i just think like that's the thing you just need to focus on what's happening right here right now and the other thing is like what you can control like um yeah, yes. I can't control what someone needs to say to me when they call me and what's the what's the point in worrying about what they're going to say? Like I need to focus on whatever it may be that I'm doing right now, whatever I have to do in the next few hours sort of thing rather than a call that might come through tomorrow to tell me about whatever it may be, which hopefully is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think as well it's almost, um, I can't remember who said this, it might have been either Gary Vee or Alex Wormosey or someone, but it, it was, I said something along the lines of like a lot of the stuff we worry about in the end of the day really doesn't matter anyway. Right. So it's like, well, even if it is something that's causing us stress or anxiety, it's like, will this, will this matter next week? Will this matter in three months? Will this matter in a year's time? And if it doesn't, then it's not worth putting our time and attention to now. And again, it's just this story we tell ourselves, which creates this, this, psychological stress or anxiety around all these things that really just don't matter that much. Yeah. Um, exactly. And when you have that perspective, I think it, it allows you to really just step away from things and, and calm down realistically. Yeah. Um, obviously as a, as a swimmer, as an athlete, um, it, it's, it's a challenging thing, right? Every day turning up to training, you're, you're pushing yourself in, in every way possible mentally and physically. Recently, you have just uh, just finished up or graduated with your business degree. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Two days ago, actually. Yeah. Incredible. Firstly, congratulations. And Thank you. Secondly, how was that experience with you for you in terms of fitting that in with with your current lifestyle as a as a as an athlete? And um, I guess what does it mean to you? I'm, I'm assuming it's it's quite a big achievement and um, and feeling of um, accomplishment. For sure. Um, I think I've always, always been someone who's placed a really, really high importance on education. Uh, that being said, in year 12, I turned down my spot on Junior Worlds to focus on school. I like, I knew I wanted to get into physio, pre-med, and um, I needed a very good, it was called ATAR. So I needed a good mark and good score at the end of ATAR, the year yeah. Yeah, to get into physio. Um, and I mean, I got in and I got into pre-med and I did two years of it. Oh, sorry, not two years. Well, it's meant to be a four-year degree. So I was supposed to do two years, but the two years took me five years. Um, and then I got halfway through and I thought, oh, I don't know if this is for me. Um, I And, like, I find the human body so fascinating. And I really like the idea of helping people. I think as athletes and swimmers that we we just take from everyone. We take people's time, people's energy, that sort of thing. So I think post-swimming I'd always been really set on giving back. Um, and I think as a physio, you're someone, you know, you're there to help people. So I think that was kind of why I, um, initially went into it, but, um, trying to manage physio and, and swimming just didn't really work in particular when 
the uni I was at at the time yeah. was very old school and no lectures were online. Like to do, if, even if I was doing one unit, I was in at uni two or three days a week and it just wasn't conducive to swimming. So um, I decided to study business. Um, that being said, I had a business at the time, um, a dress high business, which, yeah, I went to Shopfront, had five employees and, yeah, uh, started from scratch and then sold it in three years and it was the most incredible experience ever. So I know that my I'm very business um, mindset. So, yeah, I changed to business, um, got my electives yeah. counted for from physio and then chose a management as my major. And, yeah, that took me three, yeah, three years to do and, yeah, I just finished on Wednesday. Incredible. Congratulations. That's a, it's, it's a massive achievement. Do you, where do you, I guess, see yourself um, in terms of what direction do you, do you want to go in business wise, I suppose, after once you do end up finishing up swimming? Um, look, I've always said that management consulting for like a big firm would sort of be where, what, what I'm interested in. And I do think that's still where mm. I, um, where my interests lie in particular, like I just want to work for a big firm and experience what it's like with hundreds of other employees. I just, I guess with swimming, like it's a very, very small, you know, I mean, my squad is huge compared to our squad says 20 of us, but I just want to be a number. Like I just want to be one in 500 people like employees. I just think <laughs> it's like, it'd be such a different experience. Um, and I just, I would just want to know what that nine to five feels like. That being said, I do think um, I wouldn't be surprised if I start another business. And I mean, I'm always like, I'm a bit of a thinker, overthinker and thinker. So I, um, yeah, I guess I'm like starting <laughs> yeah. to think about like what I want to do. And I certainly think it will be um, along the helping and giving back sort of lines. Um, and I guess teaching mm -hmm. people what I know, I guess. I th and I think the online world is the way everyone's mm -hmm. going. So whether it's online courses, eBooks, that sort of thing, um, mentoring sort of in the space of what I know about time management and goal setting and nutrition and sleep. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, I just want to help people. Um, yeah. And teach people what I know and what skills that I've gained from, um, from, you know, pursuing a sporting career as well as finishing a degree. Incredible. Um, there's, a, there's a number of people that come to mind that I, I'd love to introduce you to um, that I think would be great to connect with oh, um, awesome. for down the track, <laughs> but from the, uh, from the, the mindset or I guess mental health perspective, um, is that something that you you actively work on daily, whether it be through meditation or do you have some form of routine that you like to run through to to work on the mindset side of things? Um, I think for me, meditation and uh, I, I probably don't head down that path or, and haven't, um, but I think for me, journaling, goal setting, mm -hmm. writing down like what I like, you know, uh, practicing gratitude, that sort of thing is something that I put high importance on. Um, so, yeah, I just think for me, like in particular, goal setting is so big um, and just almost keeping a log of not every day, but sort of across the week, how the week went, what did we do well, what did we not do well, what do we yep. want to improve on for next week? And even when like you start a new month, being like, okay, Your what reflection. was good about month of September? What are we going to do for October? So I think like things like that, I I find really beneficial and that's sort of um, things that really help me. Incredible. Uh, by the sounds of it, you're obviously a uh, very extremely motivated and driven um, individual across basically anything that you put your hand to, which obviously is, is a big reason as to why you've been so successful. But I think um, I'm definitely super interested to, to continue on um, following along with your journey over these, um, you know, next 12 months and um, I guess – for the listeners, just before we wrap things up, what is what does that next twelve months look like for you? Obviously, we were chatting about it before we hit record, but in terms of training and stuff, how does that progress leading into um, you know hopefully heading over to the the Olympic Games again? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we it's kind of just a lot of hard work between now and June, and then yeah, uh, Olympic trials in June, and then hopefully I'll qualify for my third Olympics, um, and then go to Paris. Um, compete there and then I think um, after those games provided everything goes to plan I probably have some big decisions to make um, I'll know I'll be taking yep. a very extended break from the sport um, just to decide um, <laughs> where I want to be what I want to do do I want to still pursue this um, so I think 
yeah, um, let my body and mind recover as well. But yeah, so for, for me, I um, the end goal right now is Paris. Well, you know, qualifying for Paris and Paris and then and then I'm having a big European holiday. <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, a massive, a massive good luck for the for the next um, yeah twelve months all the way up until the, the qualifiers, and um, we'll we'll stay uh, in touch and obviously follow along with your journey. And um, I'll share with the audience when the time comes um, some links to keep up with your competition in the lead up to qualifiers and, and the world champs, and then hopefully Paris as well. Um, but super grateful for your time today, Brianna, and um, I've really enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to following along with your journey, uh, I guess, moving forward. So thank you so much for your time. Um, if there's so ever anything I can do to, to help you out, don't hesitate to let me know. But um, yeah, I'm sure the audience has really enjoyed this insight and um, yeah, good luck. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolute pleasure. And for those who have enjoyed this episode, which I'm sure all of you have, we would love for you to share this one on your social media. So grab a screenshot of this episode, share on your story, send a link to the episode to a friend that would love this episode as well. Um, absolutely love your feedback and hearing from people listening to the show and your support is always uh, very much appreciated. So thanks so much and look forward to chatting to you again on the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast very soon.